you close your eyes with me? Start, start off today a little different. What was a time in your life when you felt like you were suffering, which you would characterize as suffering? Maybe it was pain or hurt or fractured relationship or a difficult diagnosis or some kind of loss. What's a moment in your life that you would characterize as a time of suffering? What was a time in your life that you would characterize as a time of triumph, victory, success, achievement, hope? Probably lots of images running through your mind right now, suffering and triumph. Would you choose one of each, choose one time of suffering, one time of triumph, and pull those two moments together, split screen in your mind's eye. And answer this question. Who was there with you in that moment of suffering? Who put their arm around you and cried with you? Who gave unselfishly to your need? Who helped you heal? Who was there with you in that time of triumph? Who raised the victory flag with you? Who laughed with you and celebrated with you? You can open your eyes. Thanks for doing that. Now look around the room at all the people who are sitting here. Go for it. Just look around all the people. And try to come to grips with this reality that every person without fail in this room has had a moment that they could think of that they would characterize as a time of suffering. Every person. And every person in this room has a moment that they would characterize as a moment of triumph but not every person in this room can say that there was a group of people who walked with them through those moments of suffering and triumph. And that's why we're doing this series, Come to the Table. This is a series about the church, the people of God on this earth who've been called, set apart to live whole, pure lives, this is a series about the extraordinary, unexplainable, otherworldly, even kind of relationship, kind of community that they can experience, and perhaps why many of us aren't experiencing it. It's a series about finding your base community and set around a table. So what is a base community? We've said that phrase several times this morning. You might have seen it somewhere else. Um, in the past couple months, we started using that phrase this summer. Base community is a group of people who experience the church coming to life as the presence of Jesus among them creates a community defined by four things, ministry, maturity, mission, and multiplication. Ministry, maturity, mission, multiplication. We think that the best way of thinking about this is that it, all of those things, all of those four M's uh, flow out of the intimacy that's found within that group that happens around this table. Tables are a major theme in Luke. We've been studying Luke for about a year. Maybe you've picked up on this. Maybe you haven't. There are 10 table scenes. So there's 10 times where Jesus is sitting around a table with other people. We don't think that's an accident. We think that tables are actually very central to helping us understand what the message of the gospel actually is. And so over the next five weeks, what we're going to do is investigate some of these table scenes to see what they have to teach us about base community. So this morning, we're going to start with Luke chapter 22. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. Luke chapter 22, we'll see the foundation of base community here and start to understand, I hope, 
why tables are so important when we talk about base community. So here we go. Luke 22, starting in verse 14, says this. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood, a new vow in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is at the table with me, and his hand is on the table. So everybody removes their hand from the table, probably. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to the one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could possibly be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. Not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So Jesus is observing, celebrating this ultra-sacred, very important Jewish ceremony called the Passover with his students, with his disciples, but while they're eating, he starts saying some things that they probably thought were kind of strange. Maybe you're a Christian, you've heard this text numerous times. None of this sounds strange to you. I guarantee it sounded strange to them. He's saying things about his own suffering. He's saying things about eating bread and remembrance of his body. He's saying things about his blood being poured out to make a new covenant with them. What exactly is he talking about? Well, the disciples have some context that is important for us to have, and this video does a good job of explaining it in a nice, visual, and concise way. Check this out. So two words come to mind when you think about Passover, suffering, and triumph. This is the consummate story of suffering and triumph in the biblical story so far. So it becomes this major event, and uh, the Israelites remember it. In fact, they're commanded by God to remember it. It mentions some instructions here. Here's what some of them say. Remember these instructions are a permanent law that you and your descendants must observe forever. When you enter the land the Lord has promised to give you, you will continue to observe this ceremony. Then your children will ask, what does this ceremony mean? And you will reply, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, for he passed over the house of the Israelites in Egypt. And though he struck the Egyptians, he spared our families. And so, as families grow and generation after generation kind of come, uh, they re remember this. They observe this feast called Passover to remember this time when God preserved the Israelites' life. And he did it through this lamb and the blood of the lamb. Well, basically what's happening here is... Jesus is saying what God did for the Israelites, he's about to do for the whole world. Tally Lloyd-Jones in the Jesus Storybook Bible says it like this. God's people would always remember this great rescue, but a greater rescue was coming. Many years later, God was going to do it again. He was going to come down once more to rescue his people, but this time God was going to set them free forever and ever. What's happening here as Jesus sits around a table with his disciples, as he enjoys his Passover meal with them, he's teaching them that he will become the Passover lamb. He will suffer and die and take the sins of all humanity 
on himself. And then with great triumph, he will lead the people out of oppression and slavery and into a beautiful new land where they're free. Jesus is teaching his disciples about that new land. He's teaching them about the new vow. And he's going to take, he's going to teach them what it's going to take for them to actually enter it, for the, what it's going to take for them to actually experience it. And what it's going to take is that God himself is going to have to die. And then resurrect. So whenever followers of Jesus gather to this day, so we participate again in a meal around a table, around his table, because it's at the table where we return to the center of our faith, the death and resurrection of Jesus, which is the pinnacle of suffering, and it's the pinnacle of triumph. It's the pinnacle of suffering, it's the pinnacle of triumph. There's nothing else in this world that so clearly embodies and symbolizes suffering and triumph as the cross and the empty grave. Among a group of people that fully embraces Jesus' death and resurrection, then, is, has been, and always will be, the space on earth where you can find adequate context for your suffering, adequate context for your triumph. Earlier, we did the thing where we closed our eyes, talked about what's that moment of suffering, moment of triumph. Everybody has those. Everybody goes through these moments. That's what life is, right? It's a series of... Uh, suffering, series of triumph, and then there's a lot of, you know, just normal stuff in the middle, right? But apart from the cross and the resurrection, there's no context for suffering that makes sense. There's no context for triumph that makes sense. It feels lonely, it feels isolated, it feels empty. So among a group of people who have staked their life on the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's where you find this context for suffering and this context for triumph. It's around the table where we cease working for our own agendas and well-being and we instead serve one another as Jesus, our King, serves us. We see that happening right here in the text, right? He's like, one of you is going to betray me. And they're like, well, which one? And then they get in an argument, which we've already seen, right? We've already seen this happen in Luke. They, uh, get, they get in an argument as to which one of them is the greatest. You're sitting around the table with Jesus, and you're arguing about which one of you should be remembered and regarded as the best one. It's kind of a preposterous stance to take while you're with Jesus, right? But they're doing it. And according to John— not Luke, but according to John, he says that Jesus gets down on his hands and knees and grabs a rag and a bowl of water and he begins washing the feet of the disciples and he says, do this, do what I'm doing for each other. He serves. Jesus says here, look, I know that you think about leadership the way that everybody else thinks about leadership, where you, you lord it over the people you lead, but it's not supposed to be that way with you. You serve each other. I am among you as one who serves, Jesus says. And so as people who are seated at the table with Jesus, we are servants universally of the king, but also servants of one another. The first Christians took this truth quite seriously. Listen to how Luke goes on to describe their community in Acts 2. Remember, Luke wrote Luke and Acts Listen to this. He says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who are being saved. So this is the portrait 
that Luke paints of the first Christians. This is how the first Christians were interacting with each other. They have taken this truth about servanthood and they have um, placed it right in the center of their community. This is the most primal picture of the church. A breaking of bread, fellowship, prayer, committed to gathering, sharing resources, sharing meals together in their homes. And I know that throughout Christian history, what's happened is groups have looked at this text and they have longed for it. They've looked longingly at it. They have said, why can't we have something like that? They have said, what will it take to regain that, to recapture that kind of church? Why have, why have we always looked longingly at this text? Well, it's because this shows us a picture of the church when it's alive. Shows us a picture of the church when it's alive. I remember when I first read this, when I was 19, it jolted something in me. And I think Part of the reason was because I had never experienced anything like it. And who has? Have you experienced anything like this? If you haven't, you probably look longingly at this and you're like, well, that'd be great. It'd be incredible to be a, kind, to be a part of that kind of church where everybody is a minister. The Greek word for uh, serve servanthood, uh, we translate into our English word minister, usually, or ministry, or deacon. It's uh, the word diakonos, and that's what it means. It means one who serves. All of us are ministers. The church is full of ministers, people who serve one another, that's like the essence of the church, is it not? When Paul's writing to the Philippians, what's he say? Each of you should look not to your interest, but look to the interests of everyone else. Consider others in humility better than yourselves. Have the same mind that Jesus had. Even though he was very nature God, he didn't, he didn't grasp, grasp onto that and say, I, I have to use that for my own advantage. Instead, he laid it down. And taking on the form of a servant, he humbled himself. He became a human. And then he humbled himself by being obedient to the cross. This is a picture that, that Jesus himself paints of servanthood, not just with his teachings, but with his ministry, the way that he works, the way that he loves, the way that he finishes out everything is servanthood. And so it's no wonder that that primal picture of the church is a group of people who are just serving one another. They're loving each other. They're taking care of each other. That's the church coming to life. Base communities, we believe, are imperative in regaining this and recapturing this. Did you know that the church in Jerusalem grew to over 5,000 people real fast. Probably the fastest church growth in history. 5,000 people just like that. Well, they didn't have facilities that were big enough for 5,000 people to gather in. What did they do? They met in homes, as Luke noted. They were committed to worshiping together in the temple, which is akin to this kind of gathering here large gathering, but that kind of gathering, not sufficient for experiencing the kind of community, the kind of family that Jesus has initiated through his death and resurrection. Let me ask you, how many of you typically park your car in the parking lot, you walk in these doors, grab, come in here, you grab a seat, you stand with us, you sing a few songs, you listen to an admittedly pretty good looking guy, give a message, and then you leave. You walk out, and that's it. Like, that's the whole thing. And then you say, I went to church this morning. No, you didn't. Because that's not the church. The church is a group of people who, through the presence of Christ, are, are experiencing ministry, 
mission, maturity, and multiplication. And so base communities, in a sense, are small churches. That's what they are. And they're able to walk through the ups and downs of everyday life together in a way that we all can't together. Here's some real practical examples of what a base community can do, and these are things off the top of my head, so there's a thousand more. But if someone has had a baby, uh, their base community can take them meals. Someone is in the hospital, their base community can visit them. Someone's sick, their base community can immerse them in their prayers. Someone loses their job and is struggling to get by, their base community can sacrifice for them and help them get by. Someone experiences a time of loss or a bout of depression or a difficult family situation, their base community can wrap them in their arms and walk with them through it. Someone gets a promotion, their base community can celebrate with them. If someone trains for a marathon, their base community can cheer them on and meet them at the finish line. Someone gets engaged, they get married, or they become pregnant, or have a grand, a uh, new grandbaby, their base community can embrace the fullness of the joy that accompanies all of those things. Now, just real frankly, Lindsay and I have experienced suffering and triumph without a base community. And we have experienced suffering and triumph with a base community. And they're worlds apart. They're not even comparable. Walking through life with a base community is something that no Christian should ever do. You walk through triumph and suffering together, base communities, because they're bound together by the one who embodies the fullness of suffering and triumph, Jesus himself. 